Greetings from Cyberdelic Space. I'm Lorenzo, and I'll be your host for today's edition of the Psychedelic Salon. Our program today is titled Psychedelic Thinking and the Dawn of Homo Cyber, and it's part of a series of audio recordings from our website, palenquenorte.org. There you can find talks given by Eric Davis, Bruce Damer, Daniel Pinchbeck, uh, Terrence McKenna, and many others. And I'll tell you more about Planque Norte at the end of today's program, but for right now, let's just get into the presentation. And this is a talk that I gave at the end of May in 2001, less than four months before the events of September 11th, I might point out. Now, this talk was given at the Mind States 2 conference being held in Berkeley, California that Memorial Day weekend. And it came near the end of the conference, right after a presentation by an esteemed panel of elders. In this talk, I presented my personal concept of a psychedelic thinker, and I hope you'll enjoy it. This comes at the end of the weekend, which has been kind of a psychedelic weekend, to say the least. But the more I got thinking about it, uh, the subject, the topic I want to talk about, psychedelic thinking... Psychedelic thinking is really like this beautiful multifaceted jewel that we all hold up and illuminate with our own consciousness. And so it's a little different for each and every one of us. And like all of you, I've come to my view of this beautiful jewel by personal experience, by reading books, talking with elders, but probably more than anything from visiting and meeting other psychonauts like yourself, because that's what I see as the real value of these conferences, where we can get together and exchange one-on-one experiences, and that's what we're really all about. So today, I would like to present a mosaic that's made of many pieces. Some of these pieces I've crafted myself. Uh, many pieces have come from books from the elders, but most of them have come from interactions with, with, with you all. And when we're done with this conference this weekend, we can take all these pieces back home, including myself, and rearrange them into other pictures. But for today, this is my view of psychedelic thinking at at this particular moment in time. I think that it's safe to say, Dickens, can you hear me in the back okay? Okay. I think it's safe to say that Dickens' famous line, these are the best of times, these are the worst of times, have probably never been so true. But at the very least, I believe we can all agree, these are extremely interesting times. You know, it's this magical time that doesn't come very often in the course of of the human history. It's a time between ages. The industrial age with its materialistic outlook and its scientific progress and its wage slavery is starting to recede into the background. And up ahead of us, we see this new thing called the information age, which isn't very clearly defined yet, but it is clearly defined that we are at this stage between ages right now. And before long, we're going to be posed right between the the midpoint of these two ages, and we're either going to go boldly into the future or sink down into some quicksand well hole of Western civilization and pseudo-democracy and chaos. I mean, we're at a very important time in the history of this planet, and particularly of the history of our species. You know, under the best of times category comes the, the things like human knowledge is doubling in, in almost every 10 years now. And, you know, we, we are more and more coming into contact with people like us, not necessarily all psychedelic people, but people that are achieving global views and starting to see that what we do in our daily lives has an effect on the other side of the planet. And people are becoming a little more introspective. And I think that really is a best of times scenario. But... Then there's the worst of times, and that list is really quite long. It's been touched on several times this weekend. Now, basically, I see one of the, the biggest problems we're facing is the overpopulation of this planet by our own species. We, we have actually altered the balance of life in the biosphere because of our own actions. And we're, we're in the midst of the worst mass extinction of species since an a asteroid or meteorite hit this planet 65 million years ago. We are at a species extinction rate that is unequaled since then. Only this time, we're the meteor. We have to realize that we are the meteor this time. And the overpopulation and encroachment on species, plant, and animal habitats, along with our pollution, has actually changed the biosphere to where it's in a decline, that some estimates of species extinction rates go to the, as high as 100 per hour. But even at the lowest estimate of species extinction rate, 20 species have gone extinct since the panel of elders began their talk. 
we have lost at least 20 species. During the course of this conference, somewhere between 330 and 5,500 species will become extinct, never again to be seen in living form on this planet. Now, people say, well, how does that affect me? You know, so a few plants and insects and going out of uh, existence on the planet. How can that affect me? Every time we lose a species, our biosphere becomes more rigid. And it is, if there's fewer opportunities for life to express itself, when the inevitable ecological accidents occur, it's going to be much more difficult each time to recover. Recently, we have come, uh, the, the theory of keystone species has been established pretty well now. And a keystone species is one which, if it's removed from an ecosystem, the entire ecosystem collapses. Now, and I, I, you know, once those systems are, or these ecosystems and species are gone, particularly a keystone species, they're gone forever. We'll never see them again in living form, and we don't know their importance until they are gone. It was about uh, a little over a year ago, I was at a conference, uh, actually in this area, the ayahuasca conference, that I know uh, many of you were at, too. And at that cons conference, Constant uh, Grouds asked what I think is one of the most important and obvious questions I've heard in many years. She said, why haven't we saved the rainforest by now? Now, that's a pretty good question. We've known about this for a long time. This is a question we have to ask not of ourselves individually as much as our whole species. You know, why haven't we done that? For our species, I think, and for this biosphere to have any chance of a long-term recovery, is we're going to have to answer questions like that in a little different way. And I think there's a lot of reasons why we haven't saved the rainforest by now, but they all circle back to the problem that most of the people in charge of solving these problems think in the same way as the people that created these problems. And I think that it's time for our species, if it's going to have any hope of long-term survival, we're going to have to become psychedelic thinkers as a species. We're going to have to expand our species consciousness to see the big picture. And the, word, the topic of psychedelic thinking is obviously so big it could cover weeks of conferences. So I'm going to confine myself and, uh, to just five little sections, and I'll talk, touch on each one of these points, and hopefully we'll have a little time at the end for questions. But the first part is I'm going to talk about my view of what psychedelic thinking encompasses. I'm going to talk about ideas of where I see psychedelic thinking fitting into today's culture. And then my favorite new topic is what I consider the dawn of a new species, and it's not a transhuman species, it's a meta-human species. And then what's at stake at this moment in time? And then in the few minutes left, I will try to leave you with some of my guerrilla tactics for psychedelic thinkers, which you may find interesting. Uh, first of all, I want to clarify one thing. Just using a substance doesn't automatically make someone a psychedelic thinker any more than reading the Bible makes somebody a Christian. There's a lot of work that has to be done, a lot of commitment. And so these are my views of a psychedelic thinker, but I think a psychedelic thinker has to do a little bit more than just take a magic pill, go into another state, and come back and say, I'm a psychedelic thinker. This is my view. A lot of people don't agree with this. But I think that psychedelic thinking begins in the place, I, I call it in theospace. Uh, in, in my book, I've used that term simply because it's difficult if people have never been there to know what we're talking about. And I've played on the word entheogen, and theospace to me is essentially that sense of place that you feel when you're doing a real deep inner explore, exploration of your own inner landscape, and all of a sudden you have that aha moment, and you see there's a whole universe there. And that's, that's, when I call, that's what I call in theospace. If you're more technically inclined, you can think of in theospace as an operating environment in which consciousness operates. Many types of consciousness live and, and interact in this, this space. Now, I'm not, just like most of the speakers this weekend, it's, it's not about how you get into this space. You can use chemicals, you can use plants, meditation, yoga, and before long, some of the new virtual reality devices, I'm sure, will be classified as digital drugs. There's going to be a lot of ways to alter your consciousness to get into in theospace. But no matter how you arrive, what I'd like to do is concentrate on what you do after entering in theospace, because it's not until you get there that the possibility for psychedelic thinking can begin. So, in my, my view, centers around a lot of things, but it was, it was an interesting twist I heard recently. In, uh, there was a conference Normal put on in Washington that was uh, on ESPN, and Gary Johnson, the governor of New Mexico, made a statement. I, I don't know if it's his original, but he said his, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results each time. Uh, by that definition, 
our species is pretty borderline insane, and this country, I think, definitely qualifies. Uh, the, per the reason, I think, that we keep doing that is because we don't see the big picture. It's like, like the story of, like, we're all flatlanders. As you recall the story of flatland, it was a two-dimensional world. And every, they only had two dimensions. So everybody was a cube or a square or a rectangle. And one day a sphere comes and visits Flatland. Of course, he looks like a circle to the people at Flatland. And he'd move up and down his three dimensions, and the circle would get bigger or littler. But he couldn't describe to the Flatlanders what their true reality was because they didn't have the, the, the language for it. So one day he took a Flatlander and moved him up to the third dimension where he could see the true reality of his existence. And it's only by it being lifted to a higher dimension that we can really see the true reality of our existence. And, and as virtually every one of the elders talked about, the reality of our existence is there is, we are the same being. We are part of the same consciousness. We really are one. We are the earth, and the earth is us. And when we harm the biosphere, we're harming ourselves. And it's only at that higher dimension, I believe, that it's easier or at least possible to understand the interconnectedness of life and what our real situation is. Now, now, it's from this dimension, I think, is where we first get this feeling. We, we grok it, but then the job of a psychedelic thinker, as I see it, is to start bringing this sense back down to this plane and trying to put into words and actions what we really feel up in that space. You know, psychedelic thinking is what brought all of us here together this weekend. If, you know, the, the subtitle of this conference, you know, Investigations on Further Perspectives and Altered Consciousness. Now, this is definitely, uh, you know, a psychedelic thinking group. You're not out doing the normal holiday weekend thing. So it's, it's already an ex psychedelic crowd, as, if you will. You know, we're here because we're all explorers searching for new ways of, of being. Uh, the, Henry James, the, the writer, the brother, brother of William James, probably commenting on his brother's work, once said, the most profound discovery of my generation is that simply by changing one's thinking, one can change one's entire life. And that is really the core of psychedelic thinking. A psychedelic thinker understands, truly understands, the unlimited power of consciousness. And a little twist I'm adding to the concept of psychedelic thinking from my perspective is I don't see a psychedelic thinker as merely somebody sitting around thinking. I, I really think it's a psychedelic thinker-doer. Because unless you engage some of this thinking and, and try to put it into action and try to put it into words, try to live it, that you're not quite, in my definition, a psychedelic thinker. Because a psychedelic thinker I see as a, a person of action, somebody that can skillfully navigate the, the deep in reaches, farther reaches of entheospace, and then actively, actively participate in the evolution of consciousness itself. Now, the work begins for a psychedelic thinking thinker. The real hard work begins by asking that first question, why do I believe what I believe? And this is my starting point with a lot of people who I have uh, very different opinions of that uh, sort of attack my beliefs. Is the first question I ask them is, why do you believe what you believe? And you'd be amazed at how that starts turning your thinking around. And this is what happens to psychedelic thinkers and people in a theospace. You start questioning, why do I believe? what I believe. The people who, who have, you know, they, they come back and they have all the final answers are not necessarily, I don't see, as psychedelic thinkers, because psychedelic thinkers realize that, that the truth is ever shifting and changing, and, and the people that have absolutes and, and the absolute with the mystery of life, they come back and form religions. And I really think psychedelic thinkers are, are beyond some of those earthly absolutes. You know, babies are born, as, as Sasha was just pointing out, babies are born as psychedelic thinkers. Some, some of them actually remain that way, like the Dalai Lama, I think, has, has maintained filter-free. He's still a psychedelic thinker. He was as an infant. But most people, myself included, eventually start conforming to our culture. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, culture is, is sort of an insidious thing. It begins, you know, the children are, are the why people. You know, why is the sky blue? Why do I have to go to church? Why do I have to go to school? Why, why, why? And eventually, even the best of us parents will finally say one day, because I told you so, that's why. I mean, that, that's, that just happens. And that's when those filters of culture start coming in and, and the children start realizing that maybe it's just easier to go along if I want to get along. And so we're in these prisons that we incarnated in and it's very difficult to break out of these prisons. In fact, most people 
wind up trusting their culture over their personal experience. And that's, that's true, I believe, of the current war on drugs. A lot of people who have no personal experience with drugs still think reaper madness is scientific evidence. And that's, you know, they're trusting the culture. And psychedelic thinkers are exactly the opposite, because psychedelic thinkers are into personal experience. You know, that if, if we only had one culture on this earth as a survival strategy, trusting the culture would probably work okay. But we have a lot of different cultures. We have uh, fundamentalist religious cultures that go up and blow out 2,000-year-old statues because it conflicts with their religion. And by the way, a little aside here, the money that went for those shells that blew up those 2,000-year-old Buddhas, part of that came from the $43 million our tax dollars that were sent to them in the war on drugs. So we are actually, our nation is participating in the destruction of that art. It's terrible, this war that we're in. But the common element among a lot of these cultures, whether it's a fundamentalist religious culture or a corporate culture, the, the common element of most cultures is the people are, are taught to trust in the culture, in others' beliefs, above and beyond their own experience. And the fundamental aspect of psychedelic thinking is experience comes before all other people's beliefs. Personal experience comes belief before belief. So I think constantly we have to ask, why do we believe what we do? Psych, you know, at that conference, that ayahuasca conference, Tony Rich made a statement that resonated with everyone there. And so simple. The words are so simple. And I think that they're very profound. And only psychedelic people will understand it. But he said, we do know what we know. And that's something that you, we all resonate. We know what we know but we're now coming back to flatland and we don't have the vocabulary to bring into words what we know. But, and we don't even can't express it other than we know it. And that's why I say psychedelic thinkers are, are the most green people on earth. The psychedelic thinkers don't read the Wall Street Journal and say, well, maybe they're right. Maybe this one scientist hadn't signed on to the 700 UN scientists that say we're in global warming right now. Maybe we've got to study it more. Now, psychedelic thinkers, if you've been to a theospace, you know we have an ecological crisis. And our job is to, to put this information in some way into words and action. Which brings me to the next little subtopic, where psychedelic thinking can fit into our culture today. And someone asked that question. I was, I was almost like I'd set them up to ask it, I guess. But I think there is a place for it. When I think of American culture, one of the first things that comes to mind is a, a line from that old Talking head song, and the line goes, my God, what have I done? <laughs> you know, we look at the, we have the highest standard of living in the world, and yet we are polluting the world at a rate far ahead of anybody else. It, are these two inexorably linked? Is, it, is high standard of living pollution tied together by some natural law, or is it our culture that links these things together? Now, I once heard Terence McKenna say, culture is the ultimate cult. And I think he was right on there. You know, culture believe is, is what teaches us what to believe and what to question and what to think about, what to dream for about, what to avoid. Now, psychedelic thinking did try to enter the culture in the 1960s. There was, there was a, a lot of young people, especially when LSD was still legal, that took uh, LSD and other substances, went into in theospace, became very psychedelic. But when they tried to bring some of those emotions back into the world, they, they caused great clashes, there was tension, there were fights, there were riots. And what happened is our culture at that time just wasn't resilient enough to absorb this type of thinking. Now, I don't think it was a total failure of what happened in the 60s. Because at the beginning of the period of the 60s, this country had two major subcultures. The traditionals, who essentially wanted to go back to some pre-urban, mythological, glorious time that never existed. And the moderns, who pretty much say, well, it's not too bad the way it is. I'm starting to get my share, and I want to don't make too many changes so I can get mine. That's the way our country was at the end of World War II. And yet, by the end of the 60s, things had changed. There's a book I'll recommend to you by uh, Sherry Ruth Anderson and Paul Ray called The Cultural Creatives. And if you ever get disheartened and say, there is no hope, you know, I've been pushing this rock uphill too long, read that book. I think you will be really impressed with the potential we have at this moment in time. Ray and Anderson conducted 13 years of surveys of Americans about their cultural beliefs, over 100,000 people. And at the end of the 1960s, they discovered that 4% of the 
people in this country had left the traditionals and the moderns and had become what they call a cultural creative. And the cultural creatives, as they define them, were people who started to move outside of themselves and adopt more of a global perspective, a global worldview. And they, they became, they were more green, they were ecological, they were getting beyond environmentalism and moved into ecology and, and were looking at a bigger picture. They, the really exciting news is the latest round of surveys they did, which was about last year, because their book came out in September or October of last year, I believe, they now have discovered that the percentage of cultural creatives in this country has risen from 4% in the late 60s to 26% today. There are 50 million people in this country, adults, 50 million adults, who share at least part of our worldview right now. Now, this, these are different from the Greens, the New Agers. These people come from all walks of life because they've evolved there from being moderns. And so the cultural creative can be you know, a liberal, a conservative, in an organized religion, on a private spiritual path, but they, in one way or another, have changed their worldview to where they no longer feel like they fit. You know, it's like being an alien at a family gathering, which I suspect one or two others besides myself have felt from time to time. Well, now there's 50 million people out there feeling this way, and the biggest weakness, maybe fatal weakness, is almost to a person, they think they're the only ones. They're the only ones in their family, the only ones they know about at work, the only ones in their neighborhood or, or school or whatever. They, everybody feels isolated, and yet one in every four adult Americans is ready at least to listen to the truth, to see what's out there. They're found everywhere. I'd like to read a quote from their book, just to give you, a, uh, from Ray and Anderson's book, The Cultural Creatives, to give you a concept of what's happened to these moderns when they get there. They say, most of us change our worldview only once in our lifetime, if we do at all, because it changes virtually everything in our consciousness. When you make this shift, you change your sense of who you are and who you are related to, what you are willing to see, and how you interpret it, your priorities for action and the way you want to live. Regardless of whether you leave your home, change your job, or switch your career path, if your worldview changes, it changes everything. Now, my guess is most everybody here today is a cultural creative. Because if you weren't, you'd be in the Mer American mainstream culture and you'd be at the beach eating unhealthy hot dogs or you'd be watching grown people drive around in a circle real fast and all the stuff that we do on this traditional holiday weekend with our time, our very valuable, precious time. But you're here because you have a different worldview. You are really here, whether you've thought about this or not, is because you are consciously evolving on a daily basis really into a new being. Which brings me to my, my favorite topic right now, is the dawn of a new species. And I'm going to make it real clear up front. I'm not talking about a transhuman. Now, I can argue that on both sides, and I have. I, I really think there's some interesting thoughts about that. But I'm talking about maybe a, a step between, or maybe a final step instead of, what I call a metahuman. I think everybody agrees right now, even the the... the, the forces of darkness that are running things in Washington, in their private moments, have to agree that globally something's got to give eventually. Population can't keep going up. Pollution can't go up. Eventually something's got to give, no matter who you are. Our lives are so stressed. Extinction rates are high. Now, for a moment here, I'm going to ask everybody in this audience to use a little of your abilities of psychedelic thinking and don't react in shock to what I'm going to say, but expand your consciousness and think about this. What if the very worst predictions about what's happening ecologically are true? What if our species, the human species, becomes extinct? Now, is that really necessarily a bad thing? Let me, let me point out, well, I don't mean it quite that harshly, because uh, I want to stay around too. But historically, if you look at the, if you back up to, our, instead of our little short-term 50, 100-year lifespan view of the world, if you look at thing on a macro level where you're looking at millions of years, historically, every large-scale extinction on this planet has brought with it, afterwards, a very positive change. After the worst extinction we've ever had came the rise of mammals. After the, the mass extinction, when the dinosaurs were lost, what came after that? Primates. Now, we are now in the middle, in the midst of the biggest mass extinction since the primates arose. So what's going to happen after this mass extinction ends? And it'll eventually end. What's going to happen? I don't. I, I agree with most of the people that spoke here that 
if you have a high opinion of consciousness, that we just can't assume that uh, we're the end of conscious evolution? Are we the highest pinnacle with all our wars and fighting and everything we do? Consciousness is constantly seeking higher levels. So I really don't think we are the end of it. And when, when the dust clears after this species extinction, my concept is a new species will be walking this earth, a new primate, and it's one I call Homo cyber. The term, the term actually isn't mine. It goes back, as, the farthest back I've found it so far is in the writings of Marshall McLuhan. And I've seen a number of people talk about Homo cyber this and Homo cyber that, and everybody assumes that we all know what Homo cyber is. But I haven't found anybody that defined it, so I thought, well, why don't I just do that? So this is not a universal definition. This is just Haggerty's idea of it right now. I see Homo cyber as a new form of being that's part human and part information and is a full-fledged, 100% dyed-in-the-wool psychedelic thinker. And I'll explain this in a little bit more detail, but I see a Homo cyber as different from the, the... homo sapiens walking out in the street today as we are today from chimpanzees. But here's the very important point. I think this is crucial to the whole concept of this evolution of consciousness. Consciousness consciousness itself has now actually entered into the processes of evolution. Look what we're doing with with gene genetic research and gene splicing and nanotechnology. All of these consciously evolved technologies and processes are actually interacting in evolution itself. And now that consciousness has taken a part in evolution, we are seeing for the very first time a speciation that's taking place by self-selection. It's not some earthquake that separates two parts of a herd and and there's a genetic mutation and one becomes this new species branching off. Homo cyber is a new species that is coming into being by self-selection. And I think it's interesting that it's happening right at this point in time when things are getting so chaotic Evolution really demands that something like this happen because evolution always dances right on the edge of chaos. That's where she does her work. The rate of change of our scientific and technological progress today is beyond our comprehension. And I'll explain what I mean by that. We know things are speeding up. We know technology is improving. But what has happened, not only is the change in technology exponential, but the rate of change itself has also been exponential, become exponential. So if you're a mathematician, that you know that double exponential has some very, very strong impact. For example, the 100 years that we're in now, from 2000 to 2100, in that 100-year period of time with a double exponential growth in scientific and technological progress means we're going to experience in 100 years the equivalent of 20,000 years of technological progress. That means by the year 2025, we're going to experience the same amount of technological progress, relatively speaking, that occurred in the entire last century. So go back to 1901 and think of no no airplanes, no cars, no television, radio, no internet, and think of where we are today. Compress that into 25 years, and you'll see that's where we're going to be in just 25 years. I've heard people talking about nanotechnology and, and robotics and saying, well, yeah, those are dangers, not going to be there, but it's 100 years out. Well, not according to the curve that we're on, it's 25 years out. So I think that we need to take into account that metahumans, like like Homo cyber, are almost an inevitable result of consciousness evolving at this face, at at this 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 quick rate. Right now, wireless internet is the hot deal, and it's probably going to stay the hot deal. That there are estimates that with before the next five or six years are out, there'll be over a billion people on this planet connected to the internet 24 by 7 with a wireless device, and over half of them will be speaking Chinese. This is going to spread to the third world. This is not going to be just a rich American play toy. This is really happening. If we're going to experience 100 years of progress in 25 years, and wireless internet technology is really already developed, it's not really perfected, but it's it's a lot better than anybody, most people realize, in 25 years, it's a trivial problem to have every child, woman, and man on this planet with a wireless internet connection, where they have access to unlimited amounts of human information and can always be in contact with their friends, relatives, neighbors, and people from all over the world. Now, how is it going to change human consciousness when when we have a universal wireless connection, 
when wet-wired computers come, and I don't know if you know what that is all about, but already a couple years ago they did work with paraplegics by putting electrodes directly on their brain, and they can move a cursor around the, the screen and click a mouse by thought. This summer, uh, Kevin Warwick in England is implanting a chip in his, his arm, attaching it to the nerve, and plans to input infrared and sonar signals to see if he can read it. You know, wire, wearable computers, I believe this year IBM is coming out with their first wearable computer. So it's only a matter of time before we have our cell phones implanted. You know, if you, if you think junk email is a problem now, <laughs> wait till you have to screen it there. But this is coming. Now, how is this going to change our species consciousness? Even if they're not wet-wired, if all these people are carrying around these devices, consciousness is going to change. And if you're a, a fan of the... Uh, the uh, television program Star Trek, the first thing that has to come to mind is the Borg, right? They, they're, they're humanoids, they're part human, they've got computers built into their brains, and they're all controlled by this master computer, so they're not autonomous, they can't think for their, their, themselves. I see Homo Cyber as the exact opposite of Borg. I see Homo Cyber as, as an autonomous being which has that same processing power. See, evolution seems to favor more and more complex information processing. We don't really appreciate, I don't think, our bodies as much as we should. From the DNA in our bodies up through the neurons and the chemical processing, we're just information processing machines. We're, we're incredible processing machines. It seems inevitable that the wearable, wet-wired computers are going to involve, evolve until we can process more and more information. The, the cybernetic part is just getting information to us and processing it, but I still see the human being the processor there. The psychedelic part, though, psychedelic thinking part, in my definition of homo cyber, I see as crucial to not becoming bored. Homo cyber can, I believe, take information processing to levels that undreamed of. But what's at stake today, at this pivotal moment of time? We've got the industrial age here, we've got the information age, and we're poised between it with this big extinction rate of species. We're really poised, positioned perfectly, for evolution to squirt up some kind of new intelligent being. You know, if you look at, at later uh, current studies in evolution, they, it's not this gr slow, gradual, smooth line. There are these quantum jumps in evolution. And I think the nucleus for Homo cyber already exists in the cultural creatives. The 50 million cultural creatives are all feeling isolated. They're like in the, the movie 2001 with all those people in hibernation. And I see the mission of psychedelic thinkers is to go around each one of them and wake them up. Say, hey, we've arrived. It's time to get to work. I think that the cultural creatives being open to new ideas, being 50 million of them out there, many of them used LSD at one time. We've got all of these time bombs in corporate America and government. You don't come back from in theospace the same. So there's, these are time bombs out there. This is why the, the power elite feel, uh, fears and theogens so much. You know, they break down the barriers of culture. They, they, and once those barriers are down, things can change. The status quo is gone. And the keepers of the culture are very intent on maintaining the status quo. Those are their boundaries. You know, we already have enough people to change this entire nation, if not this planet. Keep in mind, there were only 56 people who signed the Declaration of Independence. And their psychedelic thinking brought on a, a whole new change in consciousness. We've got many times more of that in this room right now. We have enough people in this room alone, I think, to alter the balance. It's up to the psychedelic thinkers to start contacting these sleeping time bombs and wake them up to the potential of being a homo cyber, or at least being a psychedelic thinker. Our nation is just littered with these idealists, you know, former activists from the 60s, socially conscious conservatives even, people from all walks of life, many of them thinking it's just too late, you know, I've lost my chance, but they still have that little spark in them they had. It's up to the psychedelic thinkers to awaken them and to help awaken our whole species from the sleep that we've been in all these years. But it's up to a self-selecting process. Homo cyber is self-selecting. You don't need a wet wire. You don't need a computer. You just need to get as much information as you can readily get in whatever means you can get and self-select and say, I'm going to not do these crazy things these homo sapiens have been doing. They don't make sense. And, and it, it's when you make this little mental shift, you don't get quite so uptight about things. You say, wow, you know, I'm glad our species doesn't do that. We're going to have to get control. You know? So it's, there's some advantages emotionally. That it's, it's a very unique situation, I think, in this country. I don't know if it's ever happened in human history before where we have all of these people that took LSD and other substances once, twice, a dozen times, and then haven't done it for all these years. 
Once you're in theospace, you, in, in, in the theospace, you don't forget it. You remember what happened there. And many of the people that did that are, have now evolved into cultural creatives. They're almost mirrors of, of the ancient mummers or the medieval mummers. Some of you may remember that in medieval Ireland, the, the power elite at the time took, instead of, uh, they, they kind of outlawed the Irish folk tales or folk plays, and they, the mummers would put on morality plays for the peasants and trying to brainwash them into a new way of thinking. But what they did was a little different. They'd put on masks and go to the home of somebody they wanted to teach a lesson, and then they'd give them this morality play. Now, everybody knew that the people wearing the mask were shopkeepers and town officials. They didn't know exactly who they were. They were mummers, and they're putting on morality plays. Now, Today, I think we have, oh, in fact, let me do it a little aside here, because Laura Huxley pointed out something that I had forgotten. In fact, I, you know, I wanted to write this speech a week after their panel, because I knew I could change some things. But she pointed out television. Television is a modern-day mummer. They're putting on masks and coming into our homes and giving us these morality plays. You know, MTV is one of the worst, with their holes in the brain lies about MDMA. You know, that these mummers are coming in, but I see cultural creatives as sort of the mirror image almost of modern day of the ancient mummers or the, the today's cultural creatives are putting on masks and going into the dens of the power elite the only thing that's wrong with that picture is they're still using the lines the power elite gave them instead of reciting their own lines that's what would make them a perfect mirror image I think one of the most powerful tools that homo cyber has in the evolution of consciousness is to teach the modern-day mummers who are already in place, wearing their masks in the dens of the power elite, to start reciting their own lines, to quit spouting what they get-along, go-along philosophy. You know, these should be the best of times. With the double exponential growth in science and technology, we should, we should be approaching this wonderful technological singularity where, where something of magnificence goes beyond this, this event horizon that we can't even imagine. And yet, there's a cloud on the horizon. In fact, about 40 years ago, the cloud was on the horizon. It was no bigger than a man's hand. But today, that cloud is, is covering our skies, and it's a cloud of war. I was walking down a, a, a beach about a few or three or four weeks ago, and it was just south of a big marine base where they were conducting war games, and they were dropping bombs and exploding ordnance, and it was very clear on that beach. If you've ever been in, in, around an ordnance or in a war, you, you know what that sounds like. Even though it's sort of a dull thud from a distance, you recognize it. And I looked around on the beach, and nobody seemed to be paying attention to it. Now, if, if they just didn't realize what they're hearing... It's the sounds of war, and the only time you usually hear, hear the sounds of war is when you're very close to the front lines. And the front lines are all around us right now. When I, during the 50s, when I was growing up, I lived in terror of World War III. In, in our classrooms in school, we actually did those duck and cover drills. You know, we were under the desk with our heads over it, waiting for that blinding flash, and we knew we'd see our bones. And, you know, we went through all that terror, and we knew that at the end of all that flashing, those of us that were left, if we didn't do it right, would end up in a Soviet gulag. Well, here it is almost 50 years later. And World War III is real. And so is the gulag, only it's an American gulag that we're in. The European Union has 100 million more people than we do, and we have six times more of our citizens locked in cages. The, the, we are arresting people at the rate of, of at least, if not more now, of 1,600,000 people a year on drug-related charges, over half of them for possessing pot. Now, the facts in the drug war are just totally insane. And remember the, the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over. Look at the facts. 400,000 people plus die each year from tobacco-related illnesses. Over 150,000 die each year from alcohol-related illnesses. That's on top of all the people that have driving accidents when they, in, on DUIs. And over 100,000 people died last year from prescription medicines. Now, take those numbers, 400,000, 150,000, 100,000, add them together. In that same time frame, the combined deaths from crack, cocaine, and heroin, all three combined, were 8,000. And in the last 50 years, as near as I can find out, there hasn't been a single related death from smoking pot. Now, what's wrong with that picture? 1.6 million people being arrested for a substance and substances that are orders of magnitude more safe than the ones that are company approved. You know, people are altering their consciousness with illegal substances based by the power structure. These substances being safer, this looks very gulag-like to me.
It's okay to take Prozac and Ritalin because they make you think like we want you to think. It's not okay to take MDMA or LSD or cannabis because that makes you think a little different. Now, what's this really all about? Recently, I, I received an email from the Alchemine Society, and if you don't belong to that, you really should. Just They send out all these, these notices. They don't overload you with information, but they send out these little bits whenever there's something worth seeing. And they sent out a link to... Uh, an article in the Michigan Daily, a, a college university, a college paper, a, a man named, a young man named Josh Wickerham wrote this, and I think he gets it. I don't think he gets it. I know he gets it. Here's what he said: The war on drugs is not a war on substances; it's a war on states of mind. And theogens are not illegal because a loving government is concerned that you're going to hurt yourself by smoking pot or tripping in your bedroom. And theogens are illegal because they make you question authority. They break down socially constructed fables and cleanse the doors of perception. They make you question the wrongs of society in a fundamental way, making you dangerous. You're like Neo in the Matrix when all of the illusions have been irrevocably stripped away. That's what they're afraid of. I think it's very well said. And the thing, I guess, the single thing that makes me an incurable optimist that everything's going to turn out all right, and I agree with Ann Shulgin, maybe things are... are going the way they're supposed to be going. I personally think that we're on schedule and under budget right now. You know, it's going to be uncomfortable, but you know, the, the young people, and I've met so many of them here, we've, the, the young people today that are in their late teens and early 20s are ahead of where I was two years ago. I mean, young people today get it. They really know what's going on, and that's our hope. That they're going to be running things real soon. I wish they were running them today, quite frankly. I say that for them, too. You know, World War III began in the United States. It's the war on drugs. And it is truly a world war, but what is unique about it, it's not nation against nation this time. It's nations against their own citizens. That's what World War III is. And a large majority, almost three-quarters of the people in this country, believe the war on drugs is an absolute, complete failure. Three-quarters of the people. I thought this was a democracy. Maybe not. Now, what are the real objectives of the war on drugs? It's obviously not public safety, or we'd include cigarettes and, and alcohol in our, in our real prohibitions. The objective, obviously, is to remove the freedom from certain classes of people. Of the 800,000 people arrested for possession of marijuana last year, over half were Hispanic. Seven times more African Americans go to jail for the same drug-related offenses as Caucasians do. As you all know, you're all very familiar with the history of the war on drugs. It began as a race war, particularly cannabis against Hispanics and expanded against jazz musicians, African Americans. It began as a race war, and it still is a race war. But what's interesting now is it's starting to expand a little farther than they thought. You ask any current DE agent, DEA agent today, and there's maybe one or two here that you can find and ask. <laughs> and I hope they're learning something if they're here. But you ask them what their, their biggest problem is today, and they're going to say, oh, it's young kids going to raves doing MDMA. And it's the problem because these are the young white kids going to raves doing it, middle class kids, wealthy kids. Now, science, as you all know, if you don't know, go to map site and you'll learn real clearly. Science proves that used properly and under the right conditions and at the frequency that's recommended and all, MDMA is perfectly safe, used properly. And, and yet the government, with our tax dollars, is, support, is, is just promoting this big lie. It's, it's a total media misinformation about it. Even MTV, you know, and, and, and as they said, we own the youth. MTV is a Trojan horse outfit. If you saw that, uh, that special on MTV, they, they showed this picture of this young woman's brain and told her she had a hole in her brain. It ate holes in her brain. It was only the day before that show aired that the people at MAPS were able to find her and get a hold of her and say... You weren't misinformed. They lied to you. That's not really what that picture showed. And yet, I know, I know teenagers today, 15 to 18-year-olds, who say, oh, I'm never going to do MDMA. It puts holes in your brains. I saw it on television. I mean, that is getting out there. Why are the power elites so afraid of MDMA? I, I don't think they're as stupid as I'd like to imagine. You know, I, I don't think they're just listening to these government shills who get paid atrocious sums for bogus science because they're lazy. I think that at least some of them remember that back during the Cold War, the CIA and the Pentagon tested over 800 compounds for chemical and biological warfare agents. When they got to MDMA, they didn't spend much time on it because all their test subjects became pacifists. Now, 
how is a military empire going to survive if the nation is all pacifist? And that's, I think, the big fear with MDMA, my thought. War on drugs, World War III, I think, is now about to enter its final stages. Gaia is on one side and primitive humans are on the other side. And Gaia is slowly building her forces. You know, she's got the Greens and the New Agers and the cultural creatives. And now Roboman is coming, you know, the Homo Cyber. I think that it's no coincidence that Homo Cyber is appearing at this point in time. We're all experiencing accelerating change and strangeness and weirdness. This is caused, I believe, primarily by these two ages rubbing up against each other. There's another phrase for the time we're in, and it's coined by Jean Houston in her new book, Jump Time, which is the phrase. And she's detailed a lot of information about the fact that, about evolutionary jump times when quantum changes takes place and take place. And she really sees us in that time right now. A quote from her book about the times that we are now in. We are heirs to an extraordinary speeding up of the evolutionary process. We jump to new professions, partners, lifestyles, and religions seemingly at will. Nothing, it seems, is impossible for us. Nature, through us, seems to be entering a new epoch. Not so much biological evolution, but conscious evolution. We have become conscious of our capacity to direct the next phase, not only of our own lives, but of the world's destiny as well. Now, I, I really hope that when she says that, She's talking about psychedelic thinkers and homo cyber, and she's not talking about the people that are running things today, because there is a chance to direct the affairs of the world, but they seem to be directing them in a downward spiral. You know, there are many things that are pointing to the fact that a big shift in consciousness is about to take place. Uh, the Mayans, the ancient Mayans have their prophecy, as you know, of, of 2012, in which there is a quantum change in human consciousness. The Hopis also use that date 2012, but theirs is more of an apocalyptic change. They're very mystical thinking to us. The, a bridge between the mystics and the scientists is probably Terence McKenna's time wave, where he's talking about the end of history as we know it, and the end of time, again, the 2012 date. And in the pure scientific realm are, are writers like Werner Vinge, who has talked about the technological singularity that mathematically he sees as inevitable. And by that singularity, he is talking about some form of intelligence exceeding human intelligence. It could be machine intelligence, or it could be humans with machine augmentation. Now, Vinci sees his date as somewhere between 2005 and 2030. So we've got this 2005, 2012, 2030. At least we know something's about to give, and it has to. Now, I see the jump in consciousness being machine augmented humans. And it could be just the machinery we have available today, whether it's a cell phone, whether it's, it's the internet, whether it's a personal uh, assistant, PDA, whatever it is, we're augmenting our capacity to bring information in, process information at faster and faster rates. And I see somehow of, of a cybernetically enhanced human, whether it's in the head or outside the head or attached to the body as being the prototype of this next change that is coming. In my book, The Spirit of the Internet, which a lot of people think is about, must be about e-commerce or dot-coms because it says internet in it. Well, the subtitle is Speculations on the Evolution of Global Consciousness. And I try to blend the Mayans' concept of a quantum jump of, of in the change in consciousness with Vinji's idea of machine augmented humans with Teilhard de Chardin's concept of the noosphere. If you, you haven't picked up the book, it's very big in the 60s, it's called The Phenomena of Man. Uh, I highly recommend that as well. In that book, Teilhard de Chardin spoke of the noosphere as being actually a living tissue of thought surrounding the planet. There's the geosphere, the biosphere, the atmosphere, and the noosphere around it. And he foresaw the noosphere essentially as our species consciousness and predicted a time when the noosphere would achieve sentience but some form of sentience on its own, its own, the omega point, he called it. And he described that as all members of the species having an ability to tap into a, a global brain and yet still being autonomous, sort of about everyone having super psychic ability. And when you read about some of these new wearable computers and their ability to place you in, in space and time, you'll see that some of the things he's talking about may be coming to pass. In fact, I found some of his writings after he had completed that book 
and he spoke about the mechanical infrastructure of the noosphere. He wrote this article in 1947, when there probably weren't more than five or six computers on the world, on the planet, and he predicted that computers could play a part. And in my book, again, I speculate, obviously, that the Internet is the mechanical infrastructure of the noosphere. Not an original thought. I thought it was when I first came up with it and started researching my book and found several hundred websites talking about it. So this is in the, in the air. And the discussion of a global brain is much more than science fiction. There, in fact, there's one of the mailing lists on the Internet is the global brain mailing list. They're almost all PhDs who are thinking about what is going to happen when everybody does have universal connectivity. Is there a way for interaction of all these processes? Can a, uh, an airborne sensor in Chicago sniff the air and say, man, that plant in L.A. is affecting my citizens here and shut it down? You know, are we going to get to some sort of a regulatory basis? I don't know what's going to happen. But there's sure a lot of people studying these things and talking about them. I believe, honestly, the final battle over freedom of thought, freedom of consciousness, is going to be fought in cyberspace. And I say that because digital drugs are on their way. And by digital drugs, it's kind of a... People don't like that subject, that title. But what I'm talking about, to this audience, I can explain it with those terms. Some of the new virtual reality devices and some of the things Gene was talking about yesterday can actually alter one's state of consciousness in much the way, same way as taking a tab of acid. What's going to happen when these things hit the market? Think about it. I think the war on drugs is going to enter its final battle there. You know, the Alchemine Society has defined it as, as cognitive liberty, freedom of thought, freedom to use our own minds as we please, as we choose, and alter our consciousness as we choose. What happens when we have digital drugs, virtual reality that machines that actually alter our consciousness and there's no substances coming into the body? You know, it's not going to be about substances. Once that's done, once they are on the market, the power elite is going to, to have to admit it's not substances they're trying to control. It's consciousness. And I believe ultimately in this battle, these primitive humans are going to be overcome because homo cyber has psychedelic thinking on their side. You know, the humans just aren't smart enough as a species to prevent war. You know, it's pretty obvious. We fight among ourselves. And this new species, I think, is going to rise to the top of the food chain. And keep in mind, it's self-selected. Everybody on the planet, I believe, by 2025, is going to have the opportunity to have a 24 by 7 Internet connection, wireless, and they can make their own decision whether they want to participate in this new speciation. It's not going to be accidental mut mutation that changes this quantum change in consciousness. But to succeed, I think revolution is the wrong word. I think homo cyber must become an evolutionary and not a revolutionary. Which brings me to my final topic, almost on time, which is guerrilla tactics for evolutionaries. You know, they, they say it's always darkest before the dawn, which doesn't make sense to me. I think it's darker a little farther back. But I think we can agree that the forces of darkness are certainly in charge, you know. that We've got two oil company executives setting our nation's energy policy, you know. And on top of that, you know, they, they don't see any need to limit carbon dioxide emissions. They want to use tax dollars to subsidize the building of new refineries. And they want, where are they going to get the, the crude oil for the refineries? They're going to pillage our national, or Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, the most pristine a land that us taxpayers own. And the big lie they're starting to promote, well, we have this energy problem in California. Less than two one-hundredths of one percent of the electricity in California comes from oil. Less than three percent of the electricity in the United States comes from oil. You know, they, the, Darth Vader has taken over Washington. Yeah? How are we going to get it back? Well, I once heard Ken Kesey say, they, somebody asked him what the most important thing was he learned in the 60s. And he said, well, one of them was, don't go head-to-head -head with a dumb guy with, carrying a gun. And I think that's excellent advice. I'd like to take it to a higher level and say we don't even want to use guerrilla tactics against dumb guys carrying guns. But the 60s, I think some of the activists had a, made a mistake of trying to ferment a revolution. Revolutions seldom change the daily life of the average citizen. So for our species to end the threat of, of uh, extinction, and our species being homo sapiens that branches to homo faber, man the tool maker, homo cyber, whatever branch of the species you want to place yourself on, we need evolution of our culture, not revolution of our structures. Our structures will evolve following the cultural revolution. Hybers, homo cyber is an evolutionary, not a revolutionary, and homo cyber is a psychedelic thinker. 
And the job of psychedelic thinkers is to nudge all of our species consciousness into a more of a Gaian awareness. And we do it by standing up for the truth. It's not easy. You know, we have to counter that big lie about the hole in the head. How do you do that when you're a mummer be deep behind enemy lines? You know, you, you, you can't just lose your cover because we need people back there, too. But remember, psychedelic thinkers are people of action, but not revolutionary actions so much as evolutionary actions that accelerate the evolution of consciousness. Now, if you're a mummer in deep cover, I'm not suggesting that tomorrow morning you go blast open your boss's door and say, you know, I'm mad as hell about this drug testing and I'm not going to take it anymore. I don't think that's the right approach. Instead, I think that when you get home, you can take off your mummer's mask and become a memer. Now, now Richard Dawkins coined that term meme as a unit of cultural transmission, sort of the DNA of consciousness. They're very powerful. They're unpredictable. You don't know when one's going to take off and one's not. So in the few minutes I have left here, I'm going to give you a couple examples of what a meme could grow out of. These are not memes because they're not succinct enough. But here's, here's one. Right now, we've had this big tax cut because we want to put hand, money back in everybody's hands so they can pay higher gasoline prices. Well, why don't they eliminate the middleman and just give the money to them directly, you know? But I've got a better idea. Why don't we nationalize the oil companies and use their obscene prices to lower our, our gas prices? There's one. Here's one that, that could have some power. Last year, over 50 million pieces of email sent to the White House and Congress went unread, straight to trash, didn't even look at it. Well, why not, every time we send an email to our congressperson or the White House, send a carbon copy to a world leader that might be on your side? As soon as Bush uh, said he's going to abandon the Kyoto Treaties, the Chancellor of Germany was right on his front door saying, hey, this is not right. Well, what if that guy had a million copies of emails that we'd sent to Bush and Bush says, well, that's what my people want. And he says, well, i got a million of your people here that don't want that. Why don't you read your mail? Another one. Uh, at work or school or wherever, if somebody's pointing out the big lie like hole in your head from MDMA, come back in the next day and, and leave a printout from the map site that tells the other side of the story. Or print out the, this talk. I'm, I'm putting the full text of this out on our website, matrixmasters.com. Be out there by the end of the week. Print it out and leave it laying around in conference rooms or other types of information. Another little meme. Here's one. Don't vote for any incumbents in 2004. And if you say, well, what about the good ones? Well, you know, the Republicans want to cut down 100 trees and the Democrats only want to cut down 60, you know. Well, if you're a good incumbent, why don't you resign six months before the election and say, I'm supporting the people don't vote for incumbents. It, what if on 2004 election day, everything except two-thirds of the Senate, all those office holders were brand new? Now, that would be a mandate, I would think. And a, a final little meme, don't work for companies that do drug testing. That takes your mind out of the military prison industrial complex. They don't use your mind. And don't buy products from companies that do drug testing. We need to get some people putting databases up and say, hey, these companies, these products and services, these people are doing drug testing. Let's just vote with our dollar and abandon those people. Those are only approximations. But that's the idea. You know, so what's it going to be here? The best of times or the worst of, of times? I think the answer to that question, quite literally, is in the hands of psychedelic thinkers. I think they're the only ones capable of making it the best of times. Small numbers of people have changed the world before. Why not us? Why shouldn't we do it? You know, we've been in, the, in, in Theo space. We know what the truth is. What we have to do is hold fast to the truth. I, I see the human species, in our entire species, inching its way up this really beautiful mountain called consciousness. You know, and we're up to this ledge right now where we can look down and see, wow, we've really come a long way, but boy, the peak is way up there. You know, it's a high pinnacle. And each and every one of us right now needs to choose, which we do every day. Do we continue our climb? Do we slide back down the mountain? Or do we hew out life here on this ledge that we've come to? I think that it's clear that you're all here today because you're climbers. And I can't tell you where you're going to find your next handhold. Some of you may make the conscious decision to become a homo cyber. Some may want to keep your deep cover as memers and operate behind the enemy lines but use your own dialogue for a change. Everybody has to choose, the, or doesn't have to, but I recommend people choose the path that's best for them because we need people on every path. There's not a single right one here. What's important, I believe, though, is for psychedelic thinkers the world over to finally stand up and be counted. We have to start speaking the truth and standing up in whatever way we can. We're at a point in time where the newosphere is beginning to really intensify its focus in the Internet. Human history is 
entering a new age, between two ages, the pace of life is accelerating, our whole species and many others are dancing right on that fine line of chaos. And yet that's precisely where evolution does her best work. So, you know, the choice is up to us. Do we take the red pill, evolve higher? Do we take the blue pill, go back to sleep? My guess is everybody here has already taken the red pill. Some of you took it recently, I think. You know, almost by magic, that little red pill releases one from becoming this lowly creature crawling on the ground. And we become transformed into these beautiful butterflies flying right on the edge of chaos. And maybe, just maybe, it's going to be your wings that create that little disturbance that propels human consciousness to its next higher level. I really think all of you here today, for sure, have chosen to be evolutionaries operating on the front lines of consciousness. And as they say in the movies, may the force be with you. Thank you. Thank you, I really appreciate that. So, that was my thinking on the subject in May of 2001. You know, and if you think about the fact that my comments about war in that talk came less than four months before the 9-11 tax, the War on Terror, and the Patriot Act, it almost begins to sound a little spooky, you know? But, hey, the psychedelic community is used to things being a little freaky from time to time, right? In fact, I think a lot of us like it that way. Of course, little did we know back then what the screwheads in Washington were planning to unleash on a largely unsuspecting American public. But, hey, that's another story for another day. I might add, by the way, that my thinking about the concept of homo cyber has now evolved uh, more into what I call homo divinus. And if you're interested in looking into that a little bit more, you can read some of my current thinking about this subject on our website. Actually, uh, we've got a small family of websites under the Matrix Masters banner. So if you go to matrixmasters.com, you'll find links to our alternative news summaries, uh, our, our .netter experiment, our Blanque Norte, which is the select section of the site where our collection of MP3s are located. And if you're only interested in the audio section, you can just go there directly. That address is planquenorte.org. P-A-L-E-N-Q-U-E-N-O-R-T-E dot org. Planquenorte.org. And I hope you'll join us for our next edition of the Psychedelic Salon, in which uh, we're going to present a talk given by Terence McKenna at one of the legendary and theobotany conferences in Palenque, Mexico. In fact, this one was given uh, in January of 99. It was one of his very last talks down there. And it's really a classic. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Well, that's about it for today. Thanks again for joining us. And uh, now why don't you just kick back, relax, and uh, spend a little time thinking about what psychedelic thinking can do to enhance your own life. So for now, this is Lorenzo signing off from Cyberdelic Space. Be well, my friends. Hi, this is Lorenzo again. The program you just heard was one of my first 70 podcasts, which I produced in 2005 and 2006. Over the last few years, I like to think that the shows have gotten a little better, and uh, now there are around 200 free programs for you to listen to here in the Salon, with more coming out each month. For the first four years of the Salon, our expenses were covered by a small army of donors who contributed their hard-earned cash to help offset the costs of equipment, disk space, and uh, bandwidth, among other things. And some of those donors have repeated their generosity on more than one occasion. But it's always kind of bothered me that uh, by mentioning the donors' names at the beginning of the program, I was also indirectly uh, soliciting more donations for the salon. And uh, in a way, I guess that's uh, a fair assessment. However, the majority of our fellow saloners, I find, aren't in a position to make a donation. And from the email I receive, it seems to bother people that they can't do that. So I've made a little change lately in that I removed the donation button from our web page and stopped accepting monetary donations. Instead, I have decided to fund the operation of the salon from the sales of my audiobook, The Genesis Generation. 
And while the $12 cost is still too much for many of our saloners, we only have to sell about a dozen books a month to cover our costs, and uh, so far we're on track for doing that. So if you're interested in helping to support the Psychedelic Salon financially, you can do so by either buying a copy of my novel for yourself or by sending a gift certificate for one to a friend. And as you already know, you can listen to the first chapter for free in my podcast number 186. And if after hearing the first chapter, should you want to buy a copy, you may do so through my website at www.genesisgeneration.us. And, uh, hey, thanks again for listening to the Psychedelic Salon. I'm really glad you found us. 